All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining in for our first uh, school class. This is the first time I've done this online, so I'm kind of excited about this. A lot of these courses I'm going to be offering for you guys are courses that I used to teach at the UW and Tacoma Community College as well. So you'll be able to uh, see a lot of the classes that I used to do. I haven't been able to do them for a long time just because my schedule has been crazy. But since we're all locked at home, I figured this would be a great chance to, to share these uh, courses with you guys. So we'll get started. Now with uh, the Ghostology 101, I basically wanted to do a quick introduction into the history of ghost hunting. So it'll be a lot of the history, where it comes from, and where we're going uh, when it comes to the paranormal. So go on here I so will kind of monitor chat so if anybody has a question if they wanted to put it in the chat otherwise everybody will probably be muted yes so we talk about ghosts today and i always have to ask you know how many people have actually uh seen a ghost and i'm always curious to uh, what people's experiences have been and I, a lot of people have had those experiences now Moving on from that, I always get asked, you know, or I always ask people, you know, do they believe that ghosts exist? And of course, you know, a lot of people that attend my lectures or classes pretty much have a good idea that they do exist. And the biggest question I always get asked is, do I believe they exist? And I've always expressed to people that I'm not one of those ghost hunters that's trying to convince you that ghosts do exist, because in all honesty, you have to have those experiences for yourself because I could have the best evidence of a ghost walking right up to the camera going, boo, I'm a ghost. And if you don't believe in ghosts, all you're gonna do is just judge my credibility. So you really have to experience a lot of this stuff for yourself. All I try to do in this field is try to open people's minds to the idea that there could be something out there. And a lot of this is what you're gonna experience. Now, 89% of people believe in miracles. 68% believe in the devil, 31% believe in astrology, and 27% believe in reincarnation. And this was a poll done in 2003. Now, when they did uh, this poll on ghosts in 99, they found that there was 48% of people believed in ghosts. Well, since then, it's now grown to about 62%. So the belief in ghosts continues to grow every year. Now, 60% of those are believed to be women. So it doesn't surprise me being in this field as long as I've been in this field, there are a lot of women in this field. And I always thought it was interesting because uh, one out of six people actually believe that they've actually had an experience with the paranormal as well. And this could be various experiences when it comes to ghosts. Now, Another really important question that people always ask me is what makes a good ghost hunter? And I always say it's a PDP and that is the passion, devotion, and patience. Now what that means is be passionate in what you do, be patient in waiting for it to come, and be devoted in making it happen for you. Also another thing that's very important is honesty. You don't need to make up ghost stories or experiences to get people to believe you. Another thing is education. Learn as much as you can about this field. Having an open mind is also very important as well. And a fair share of skepticism because you don't want to go into a place that you believe is haunted and start pointing at every little strange thing and say, oh, that's a ghost and that's definitely a ghost. Because being a paranormal investigator, you always have to try and debunk that experience first before you label it as possible paranormal activity. Now, when it comes to the term paranormal, this means beyond normal. And always you, you're asked, what is normal? Now, of course, that is phenomena that can be explained by known laws of nature. Now, of course, uh, most people fear what they don't understand. And so you have to also consider the fact that uh, people believe that the world was flat back in the day. And so there literally was this huge fear that they would actually be on a boat and fall off the edge of the world. But through science and exploration, they found out that the world is actually round. You're not going to fall off the edge of the world. So we're kind of in the same boat here where we're exploring something that really they don't have all the answers. But yet there's this thing that, you know, skepticism when it comes to this. Now, when science, you know, comes into play, um, we are exploring the unknown. 
And so I, I always get asked, so, well, and, and here's another interesting fact I want to point out too, as I am starting to get a little ahead of myself here and I apologize. Um, a lot of people always ask me is, you know, why isn't there a lot of science going into this field? And you have to understand that uh, a lot of people in this field don't really understand how to do a scientific investigation. Um, a lot of these people are basically inspired by the shows that they see on television and they're not being scientific on these shows. So you don't see a lot of money and research going into the paranormal on a higher level because people put money into research because usually there's a profit in the outcome. So there, people don't see a profit when it comes to exploring the paranormal. And so that's why you don't see a lot of this um, being explored by you know, high-end scientists. But we also have to consider the fact that there's still a lot of the world that we don't understand about our universe. We're still exploring a lot of this stuff. So one of the things that I always suggest to people or always tell people is you know, when it comes to proof of the human being, you know, we rely on our five senses. And so the one thing we cannot prove exists is the soul. This is one of the things that we rely on faith. So the history of ghost medium is basically all cultures believe in some form of afterlife. It's become the basis for most religions. Almost from the beginning of time, man has talked about ghosts. You have your ancient Greeks, Egyptians, Romans, even Shakespeare wrote about ghosts. And the first century AD was when the first ghost stories were actually written. Now, early Hebrew scriptures talk about the living trying to contact the dead. And so communicating with ghosts actually became very popular in the 1850s. And a lot of people don't understand why that was, but what really started this was basically that need to make contact with the other side. And so spiritualism started back in the 1850s. And it all started with these two young sisters known as the Fox sisters. And they basically lived in a house in New York and they believed that they had a ghost in their home. Well, it was these two little girls that basically came up with a simple way of communicating with a ghost. And that was one knock for yes and two knocks for no. And so this became a huge thing in trying to communicate with the other side. Now, this is where also the, the term medium started to come about. And if you're not sure what a medium is, this is a person who can pass on information from the dead onto the living. Now, continuing with this, you had seances. Now, seances became a huge thing back in the day. And this really started to become popular by the 1870s. In fact, it was so big that they had what they called home circles. And this would be done in people's homes every weekend. This was like their social gathering. The highlight of the weekend was to have a home circle. And in fact, there was also a magazine um, that was actually known as a spiritualist that taught people how to do seances. And it brought mediums to a very popular height. In fact, another popular thing that they would do is called table tipping. And if you're not familiar with that, that's where you actually, the group of people will gather around a table and you'll rest your hands, as you see in the picture, rest your hands on the table. And they say with this group connection, you'll actually be able to lift and rock the table across the floor without physically lifting the table itself. You just, by having your hands pressed on the top of the table. And again, this was a huge thing. Now, the battle of the mediums. Being that uh, spiritualism was so popular and all these mediums were popping up left and right, each one of them claiming that they were the ones that had the best way to communicate with the other side. So it did become a time as to who had the better show. Now, continuing on with this, by the early 1900s, ghost hunting had begun with all these mediums popping up left and right. Um, they wanted to know exactly what was going on when they made these claims. So by the 1950s, unfortunately, it had all died out. And I'll go into that a little bit more a little bit later in the presentation as to why it died out. But uh, just to continue on with this timeline, uh, back in uh, 2004, ghost hunting became a huge thing again. 
And the reason for this is actually because of these guys here, Ghost Hunters, aired on the Sci-Fi Channel. And so this brought ghost hunting to this, you know, hot topic, you know, uh, ghosts are the rock and roll of today. So, yeah, we got to blame Hollywood for all of this. But how much is really fact or fiction when it comes to the paranormal? Now, everybody loves a good ghost story, whether you believe in ghosts or not. We all like to get scared every so often. That's why we, uh, we love horror movies as well especially June. But unfortunately, we don't have any proton packs or ghost traps. Uh, to develop tools like that, you have to know what a ghost is made of. And we don't know this. We're still exploring a lot of this stuff. Now, movies or in Hollywood have taught us to fear ghosts. They're out to get us, to harm us, or even to kill us. But it's our own imagination that scares us the most. We're the ones that are going to be exploring a creepy old place, hear a strange noise, quickly turn around and run, fall down the stairs, and then you say the ghost pushed you. Yeah, that's become a very common thing. But we also have to understand our obsession with death because this is a root to a lot of this. Now, we have been obsessed with death since the very beginning because we don't want to believe that death is truly the end. You don't want to believe that your life is like a switch that you turn on and off. So there has to be a purpose in life. You know, this is why we fight to have some sort of legacy, some, something to remember us by. Now, a lot of this also, we question the fact that is, is death truly the end? You know, is there some sort of immortality? You know, life after death would be that as well. Now, the art of dying was to basically to die at home, in bed, without pain, die happy, you know, even with your family all around you. But we're never guaranteed how we're going to die. We don't know how we're, when we're going to expire. And so that builds a lot of fear as well, because we don't know how long we have. Now, death in the 19th century carried a lot of these medieval customs, and I'll kind of go through uh, a few of these to kind of give you an idea of where a lot of this, you know, morbid curiosity comes from. Now, I do have to forewarn you that um, some of these images can be disturbing. Um, no, there's no nudity, but uh, we'll continue on with the death mask. Now, death masks uh, were very popular back in the day. This was a mask that was made of plaster or even wax of the person right after they'd passed away. So you have to understand too that this is before photography. So if you wanted to remember how an individual looked, you would either have to hire some sort of artist to do some sort of rendering of you. And that usually ended up being a painting. But again, depending on how good that artist was, you don't know how good of the painting was. So to get that lifelike feature, you would actually have a death mask made of you. Now, again, this was more popular amongst the, the wealthy and the famous, because if you didn't get to meet them face to face in life, now here's your chance to meet them face to face in death. In fact, here is a couple examples of death masks. These were two women that were murdered. They couldn't identify their bodies, so they made death masks of them and they hung them in the center of town, hoping that somebody in town would be able to identify who they were. The deathbed scene. Again, this is a situation where while you're on your deathbed, uh, you'd have an artist come in and do some sort of painting of you. And uh, the one that you see here in this presentation is, uh, is Abraham Lincoln's deathbed scene. And it was a huge honor to be a part of a deathbed scene. In fact, many people would love to have this opportunity. And uh, you also understand that sometimes when the artists would get there, you might have already expired. So they would just prop you up in the bed as your family stood around you while they did this uh, painting of you. Now, postmodern photography. This is when photography came around. And another simple way to remember the individual. So you'll see these photos, what look like they're innocent photos of a child sleeping in the bed there, but that child is, is indeed dead. And I'll 
show you some more examples of this, but you also have to understand that photography was a new technology. And as we've learned with new technology, it can be very expensive. So when people wanted to have these photos taken, you had to have the body shipped to the studio. And of course it was dressed and prepped for the photo. And so this is an example of a death uh, photo taken right there. They got the gentleman sitting in the chair with his head propped up. Now, as I said, it was very expensive. And so if you're gonna pay the expense to have a photo taken of the dead, it wasn't uncommon for the living to pose with the dead as well. Because you have to understand with a lot of these photos, this is probably the only photo ever taken of this individual. Now it was very popular with children. So if you ever look up postmortem photography on the internet, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of photos of children because children died so often back in the day. And here's some more examples of that. Now times have changed. In fact, by the late 19th century, people developed new views on death and it no longer had to be such a public event. In fact, you were allowed to mourn in privacy. Um, you could actually just invite your friends and family. You didn't have to invite the whole town to come and check out your dead. And it became a time as to what was respectful and what wasn't. Now we'll get a little technical here. And a lot of people always ask, well, why do ghosts wear clothes? Now, a lot of people think, oh, maybe that's what they died in. Maybe that's uh, what they were buried in, or maybe it's even their you know, favorite outfit that they wore. Because if you think about it, clothes aren't really a living thing. So you would think if somebody pass on, passes on and comes back as a ghost, you would see a bunch of naked ghosts, right? Well, there's an experiment that I always encourage people to try. And that's basically, if you close your eyes, and you envision yourself, I always ask, and I do this, you know, when I do this lecture with, you know, hundreds of students in the, in the audience, I always ask, you know, well, how many people, you know, see themselves naked? And nobody ever raises their hand. And so it's just interesting that what we think is happening in this situation is how you see yourself is how you project yourself as a ghost. So this could explain why ghosts are seen in clothes. Now, another interesting phenomena is when people do see apparitions, a majority of them are usually missing parts of their body. And a majority of these cases tend to be they're missing their legs or even their feet. And so when you go back to that experiment, um, most people don't see themselves past their torso and up. You know, they'll see themselves from the torso and up. They don't see themselves or their legs or even their, their feet. So that's something that we constantly overlook. So again, this could easily support that theory that how you see yourself is how you project yourself as a ghost. Now, as a scientific study started in this field, this all began in the 19th century. Um, and again, this was following that big spiritual movement. Now, Thomas Edison was very much into the paranormal. In fact, he was working on a ghost communication machine, but unfortunately he died before this was ever completed. So no one knows exactly where he was going with this. Now, as we continue to look onto the other side, photography um, started becoming a, a big thing as we talked about with, you know, with the postmortem photography. This also helped with uh, taking photos of the dead, of ghosts, I should say. And so this, as you see in this photo right here, you'll see what looks like a possible apparition hovering above this person. Now, as I talked about, photography started back in the early 1800s. And this was indeed the proof that people needed. When you're you know, asking for something, to, as they would say, a sitter, as what they refer to as spirits in these photos, to appear, it would be amazing when they developed the photos and you would see these sitters in your photos. Now, some of the ghost photos actually date back to the eight, uh, 1839. And only 10% of them are actually believed to be real paranormal photography. Unfortunately, there was a lot of people manipulating these photos. 
Uh, it was so easy for them to um, manipulate the plates or even as you're standing there being still um, for a photo, because you have to understand these photos, you would have to sit there for a good five minutes, um, sometimes a little bit more depending on the camera, perfectly still to get the best photo. And in that time, people would actually, you know, peek from behind the curtains because you'd see that sometimes they'd have curtains behind them and they wouldn't notice that somebody is actually peeking behind the curtains. They'd show their face for just a few minutes and then of course shut the curtains and this would give it that transparent look. It's the same uh, thing that you experience a lot in uh, slow shutter speeds. When you're taking pictures in low light, uh, your shutter speed will actually slow down so it can absorb as much light as possible. So you'll see in a lot of these photos, if somebody walks through when you're taking a picture, they'll look transparent. So these are just early examples of that. Now, some of the most famous historic photos is, of course, the, the brown lady, as you see in this picture right here. This was back in um, 1926, or actually, um, it was, let's see, uh, 1936, when this uh, photo was taken, September 1936. And this is a situation where, again, this apparition had been seen going up and down the stairs. And one day, the photographer decided to set a camera up at the foot of the stairs and it happened to go off at just at the right time when they saw this apparition coming down the stairs. Um, now again, people will say that it is a fake. Some people will say it is legit, um, but it is one of the most historic ghost photos out there. And again, we can't validate any of these photos because we weren't there at the time. Another famous ghost photo is this one of the tulip staircase where a priest actually uh, claimed to have captured this photo and as you can see here, that looks like this figure going up the staircase with this long stretched out hand right over here. Also too, even and you'll see in this uh, phrase right here that I posted, even Kodak could not verify that the negatives uh, were tampered with. So just one of the ways that they were able to validate or even help to debunk some of these photos by going to the negatives. Another famous photo was uh, this one captured at Bachelors Grove Cemetery just outside of Chicago and this was in 1991 and their claims were that this woman was not there when they took the picture and you can actually see her sitting on a tombstone there. Now, of course, I'm gonna share uh, one of the photos that I captured during one of our investigations. This was actually when we investigated at the Winchester Mystery House. And in this photo, it was just me and my team. We were going around uh, taking pictures. And this is the area where they have stored all of her stained glass windows that she has collected and they have them on display. But as you can see, there is this uh, profile right here of a child. It actually looks like a little girl, and I'll zoom in on that so you can see a little bit better. It looks of a little girl with a bonnet. And she's wearing a bonnet there. Yeah. So that was a pretty amazing experience. Again, didn't notice it at the time, only going back through the photos later. Now, continue with the scientific study. Albert Einstein actually uh, taught us that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted or transformed from one state to another. And that's basically true. So ghosts are defined as an elemental force, a form of energy. We ourselves are energy. So we still are exploring, you know, what happens to that energy when we pass. Well, there was an experiment done called the weight of the soul. And this is where a doctor took five patients on the verge of death. He weighed them right before they died and right after they died. And this was done in 1907. Now, interesting thing was, is uh, with three of these patients, their weight change was exactly one and a half ounces. Now, the other two, their weight went up and down, so it was really hard to prove, does the soul weigh one and a half ounces? I think a little more research needs to go into that. Then you also have aura photography, or also known as Carillion photography. Now this came about in 1937, 
And they thought that this was a proof that the soul existed because when you would actually sit in front of this camera and have your photo taken, you would actually see this light formation around you. And this light would be in different colors, different extremes, depending on the subject. Now they thought that, okay, this is something proving this energy or psychic forces around you. So they did an experiment called the weight of the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the torn leaf experiment. And so this is where they took a picture of a leaf. And they, uh, as you can see in this photo here, there is that leaf. And you can see that there is this light around that leaf. Then they took that leaf and they ripped off the leafy part and just took a picture of just the twig. And to their surprise, still the whole leaf showed up. That energy still remained. In fact, they've done this with folks who have lost limbs. Um, that, that shows that that energy still remains, which could explain in those cases where, you know, somebody who has lost a limb, they have what they call phantom pains or phantom itching. And they have to train people on, on how to try and, 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 and itch that itch, um, in fact, by using mirrors and stuff like that. And so that shows that there is some sort of energy that does remain. And now, again, this is only with folks who have lost limbs. They've taken pictures with people who were born without limbs, and there's nothing there. Now, some people say that this also could be our EMF field as well. So continuing on with the timeline, you also have in 1894, uh, the term ectoplasm came about. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, that basically is a, comes from a Greek word meaning ectos, plasma, exteriorized substance is the true meaning of that. And this started uh, becoming very popular when mediums started popping up left and right. And it was a white substance that would come in a solid, liquid, vaporous forms. And they believed that this was the essence of a spirit escaping from the mediums. And I'll show you examples of this in just a bit here, but this also uh, believes that this can materialize into forms such as limbs, faces, or even the full body apparitions. Now, a 17th century philosopher described a similar substance that he encountered and he called it first matter. And it's been seen seeping out of a medium's mouth, ears, nose, even coming out of their fingertips. Yeah. In fact, I'll show you some of these examples. Now, unfortunately, um, these ended up being fake. Um, and you'll see it as well. It's very clear fake when you see some of these photos. You know, they would uh, pull off these tricks by using low light settings, you know, candlelight, luminous paints. And I love this photo because you can see this, what looks like, like a doll or a puppet coming up from behind the table here. I always think it's like King Friday, you know. <laughs> but they would use like cheesecloth, you know, netting, cotton to produce this ecto seeping from their orifices. So... Due to this, you know, these fake mediums, this is what caused a lot of the skepticism as we tried to advance in the world of paranormal research. Because a lot of these mediums that were claiming that they were talking to the dead were proven to be fakes. You know, uh, Houdini was very much involved in, in proving that the, a lot of these were fakes as well. Now, what helped to, to advance them what was, of course, back in those days, was the, the lack of, you know, education. Um, of course, there was a lot of frauds out there trying to make a buck off of everybody. Uh, by the 18th century, there was a huge rise in skepticism, uh, which affected a lot of the beliefs in ghosts and, and even the afterlife. You know, science and discovery was at hand, and Charles Darwin opened a lot of minds with his ideas and theories when it came to origin of the species and descent of man. So this brought on a lot of you know discussions and debates of religion and the afterlife. So it's a lot of this is what's made it kind of hard to prove the existence of ghosts. But there is a lot of evidence out there that supports that there is something out there. Now, perception is also a big thing when it comes to exploring the paranormal. 
And this is what inspired me to actually write my book, um, Psychology for the Ghost Hunter. And I just found that it was just fascinating. And a prime example of this is if you take a believer in the paranormal and a skeptic, and you put those two in a haunted room, and they both experience something paranormal, do we believe that their reports are going to be exactly the same? No, they're not because perception plays a major part in this. And as I was exploring a lot of this, I also started to realize that there, there's a lot of cases out there too, where a group of people will, will have an interesting encounter where half of the group will, will experience something and the other half won't experience what the other half had experienced. And I thought that was kind of interesting as well. And so as I started exploring a lot of this stuff, I started to realize that there is something going on when it comes to the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain when they perceive certain, certain things. And in fact, I'm going to show you guys a picture here and you'll see a woman spinning. Now, some of you may see her spinning to the left. Some of you may see her spinning to the right. But to be honest with you, this is nothing more than just an optical illusion. They believe that whatever side of the brain is receiving the information predicts on which way she's going to be spinning. Now, I also find that if you blink your eyes really fast, you might be able to change her direction. Um, so just keep that in mind. But again, uh, this is just more research on how the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain functions. So could it be possible that when you are dealing with a group a phenomena such as where half the group has ex has experienced or they are experiencing something and the other half is not is it because they're experiencing on the left side of the brain and the other group is experiencing on the right side of the brain so i think that is something that needs to be explored in this field and i will continue to do that in, throughout my research so this also takes us into the psychic element. Now, when it comes to psychic uh, research, uh, this all started back in the late 1920s. And they started to find that there were more psychic women than men. They also found that it's one out of three people have actually had some sort of psychic experience in their life. And I feel that we are all capable of having a psychic encounter or experience. In fact, um, one of the most common things that people might experience is when you're actually thinking about somebody that you hadn't talked to in years. And while you're thinking about that person, all of a sudden you'll get some sort of communication from them, like a phone call or an email from them or a text message, just out of the blue. And it's just odd that you were just thinking about that person. That could be considered a psychic experience. Now, everybody has a possibility. I think we've all gotten lazy through technology that we're not really in tune with ourselves. So being that uh, we don't really meditate, um, we don't have that open channel for ourselves. But I think in some cases, for some people, it's just one of those right, right, being at the right place at the right time to have that experience. So I do use psychics on my investigations. I only use them as a tool. I do not depend on a psychic. And you can do an investigation without a psychic. I just feel that uh, there is some information that can come from a psychic that is trusted, that you cannot get from tools, such as you know devices that help you to read the atmosphere. So I just think it's a, another element to the paranormal that we still need to explore a little bit more. But a lot of people didn't know this, but Abraham Lincoln was considered to be a psychic. Yeah. He actually had a dream that foretold his own assassination just weeks before it actually happened. Yeah. Uh, his spirit is also known to be haunting many locations, such as the White House, uh, the Ford Theater, where he was assassinated, even the house across the street uh, where his body was taken after he was shot. Um, he's even known to haunt a location where um, his wife's dress is on display in a museum. 
that actually has the blood of, of him on it when he was assassinated. So they do believe that he haunts that location as well. So he's been seen quite a few places. So we're gonna do a psychic test, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and let's open up uh, people's uh, channels here. I wanna see who is actually willing to, to be my subject here. Anybody? Can we unmute? I'll do it. You're gonna do it? Yeah, sure, let's do it. <laughs> All right, Amy. So I'm gonna show you five symbols, okay? okay. These are actually the Zener cards, uh, which are famous for psychic uh, testing, okay? And you'll see the plus, the wavy lines, the square, the star, and the circle, all right? I want okay. you to guess from left to right what symbol is gonna be underneath that card so go ahead and what's your first guess um underneath what the cards at the bottom yes um the the wavy lines all right let's see nope no oh, okay um okay the next one i'm gonna say the square Nope. Ha. Ah. <laughs> All right. The circle. Going for the circle. Yeah. Well. Ah, man. I suck. Okay. Um, let's do wavy lines. Ah. Uh, no. <laughs> well, it's curvy. It is curvy. <laughs> it is curvy. All right. So, um, thank you for doing that. Now, you might have tested yourselves, you guys. And uh, I, I'd be surprised if you were able to get uh, all those right. Um, you might be very gifted if you did. Otherwise, you know, just by how many you got may uh, determine your own psychic abilities. And this is a simple game that you can actually play with yourself. You can actually purchase these cards online and, you know, just do like, you know, a solitaire type of thing, trying to guess the symbols. And I feel this is a great tool to help uh, practice and fine tune your own skills. So moving on here. So we're gonna get into what we fear. And poltergeist is a big thing. And this is again a German word meaning noisy ghost, but the, I, I feel that the word poltergeist gets misused quite often, uh, especially nowadays, um, because it's been mislabeled in so many different forms of media. And if you were to able to go back to the original textbook um, terms when it comes to poltergeist, um, this is actually a non-human haunting, all right? So no apparitions are ever seen in a true poltergeist case. Uh, they believe that this is really a non-channel telekinetic energy coming from a living person on the property. So these are referred to as agents. So you'll find uh, situations like um, children going through puberty is number one, uh, stressful conditions. And now they're also finding that um, women, uh, when their bodies go through changes, such as through a pregnancy or even menopause, that uh, this can actually uh, start up poltergeist phenomena as well. So um, that's why it's so important that when people are experiencing physical phenomena on their property or around them, they should be journaling their experiences. Because by journaling, you're also able to determine whether it might be happening when stress is really high on the property. So it might happen right after you know certain people have had a fight. Um, I've dealt with cases where a couple were having uh, physical phenomena on the, in their home. And it always seemed to happen after they've had a fight. So that is a true case of poltergeist phenomena. Now, getting back to this, um, they tend to be more malevolent or playful. They're known for throwing objects, starting fires, leaving scratches or bite marks. And this is a real photo from a poltergeist case. Uh, they're also known for slapping a person. 
and even lifting or tossing a person as well. Now, when it comes to true poltergeist phenomena, it's sudden activity, it's very short-lived, only physical disturbances are reported and they are extremely rare. Now, you also have to understand that uh, ghosts can cause physical phenomena as well. Ghosts can do all this stuff that I listed here. So that's why it's really important that people be journaling their experiences because this is gonna help us determine what kind of phenomena that we might be dealing with. If it's under stressful conditions, you might be dealing with a poltergeist phenomena rather than an actual haunting. Now, another case when it comes to physical activity is the entity case. Doris Bither case is also what it's known as. And this was in 1974 in California when a woman with four children was experiencing physical attacks. Uh, the story is actually she was claimed to, to be raped by this ghost. And so the situation uh, got to be well known. Uh, Dr. Barry Taff and Carrie Gaynor actually were involved and they're very well known paranormal investigators. And when they actually investigated, they claimed to have captured some of the most phenomenal uh, activity. And what their claims are, are in these two photos right here, where they claim to have uh, captured these arches of light. And you'll see them in the two photos. Now, what makes it most interesting in these photos is they claim that if it had been reflecting on the wall, the light would bend in the corner but it's not. So they're claiming that this light source that you see in the photos is in midair. And you see it in both of these photos here. So this was a very interesting case. Um, it's one of the most documented cases, especially when it comes to physical attacks from an unknown source. And this actually led to the movie known as the Entity Movie with, Dr. Uh, with uh, um, Barbara Hershey. Uh, this is actually one of the movies that really inspired me to get involved in this field. Now, she died in 1995, so we unfortunately do not have any more of her claims. But they did state that um, she, shortly after the investigation with Dr. Barry Taff, she did move away. And I believe she moved to Texas, if I remember correctly. And she did claim that the attacks happened less and less throughout her life. And so she did state up until the day she died that uh, the attacks still did happen every so often. And whatever it was, they do believe that it uh, actually followed her throughout her life. Another thing that people fear is the demon, that evil spirit. Yes, the belief that you can't have good without evil. Now, uh, most religions believe in some form of negative entity. And demons have become very popular nowadays, especially through a lot of the television shows, uh, because they definitely want to push the fear factor on everybody. And so now you'll find that most cases everywhere you go is all demons. And that is not the case. And I only bring up demons because it is something that is commonly talked about. I don't get into the, the demon phenomena because if you're going to be scientific with your research, you cannot be biased when it comes to religion. And re uh, the term demon is a religious belief. So I do not bring that to the table. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that there are negative entities out there some that have caused physical disturbances and harm to people. But I also say too, that there are a lot of people in our lives that will do the same. And who's to say that they can't do that in, in death as well. So just because you experience something negative in the paranormal field does not necessarily mean that it's a demon. All right. Now, Again, they claim it's always a negative encounter, it's dark, it must be a demon, or if people see a shadow figure, it's got to be a demon. That is not, not the case. Um, and this is my biggest argument when it comes to people making claims to demons, especially when they bring out some of their tools, like a, a ghost box, and they'll say, oh, the ghost box said demon, or my ovulus said demon. Um, there is no device out there that's going to let you know that you are confronted by a demon. 
In fact, if you go to biblical scripture, a demon will not identify itself as a demon. A demon's true purpose is to manipulate the living to commit sin. As if you read the Bible, that is the true purpose of a demon. They want to manipulate you. So a demon is not going to say, I'm a demon. It's going to tell you, oh, I'm your Aunt Mary. You know, please help me. That is how a true demon would work. So I just think it's interesting that they always want to say, oh, yes, a demon identified itself in the room. So again, don't believe those claims. Yes. Then we get into possession, the spirit attachment. It is believed that a spirit can attach itself shortly after death. So some of the things you might experience is a change of behavior, unexplainable exhaustion, changes in entire speech and moods. And I know some people have said this could also be PMS as well. All right. But uh, I thought this was interesting. And the Vatican uh, first issued official guidelines to an exorcism in 1614 and revised them in 99. Uh, signs of demonic possession include uh, superhuman strength, aversion to holy water, the ability to speak in unknown languages. Other uh, potential signs of demonic possession include spitting, cursing, and excessive masturbation. Wow. How many of you guys could be possessed? Now, a very famous case when it comes to possession is of course the Emily Rose case. And this actually was a movie uh, that was recently put out, I think in the late nineties when this movie came out. Um, but this is actually based on a true case. So it was back in the 1970s when a young girl uh, was believed to be possessed. And this case actually got to be uh, very well known because of how the case ended. And it ended in her death. They said that uh, during her exorcism, she actually died. Now, come to find out, the reason why she died was because not of the possession. She died because the priests that were in charge of taking care of her failed to take care of her everyday needs, such as food and water. And so she actually died from starvation and dehydration. Yeah. So this became such a highlighted case because the priests that were involved in that exorcism actually went to prison. They were responsible for her death. Now, it is an interesting case. Um, it has been documented. In fact, the audio I'm going to play for you guys is from that actual exorcism. So listen carefully. I won't play the whole thing. And these are photos from that actual case. Now, I actually had the opportunity to investigate a place where an exorcism actually took place. And that's at St. Louis University. Now, I know I talk about a lot, uh, this case a lot on a lot of the radio shows I do. But the interesting thing is you don't get to see the video. In this presentation, you guys will actually see the video. So the case actually is about the true exorcist case uh, that inspired the movie with Linda Blair. Yes. But the true story is actually about a little boy named Robbie. And they gave him the name Robbie to protect his identity. Now, this was in March of uh, 1949, and he was actually brought to St. Louis University. And in fact, he was brought to the campus, but he was actually uh, being taken care of by the church on the campus. And in the photo here, this is the building that I'm talking about. Uh, right next to the building, you'll see this little white part in the, in the photo. That is actually the church right next to the building. And so they actually brought the boy to this church uh, to perform the exorcism. And he actually stayed on the fourth floor. Now, I got to investigate this building because since then, the church has sold it to the campus. 
And so they, uh, when I do my lectures at all the colleges, I'll take the students on a ghost hunt around their campus. And so they took me to this building and I you know, got to explore all the different floors. But when they finally took me to the fourth floor right up here, I was kind of surprised at you know, how big it was up there. And you can see it's a huge building that they had completely abandoned the fourth floor. Um, and they, they said the reason why they had abandoned the fourth floor is because they've had too many problems on the fourth floor. And when they say problems, they're actually referring to paranormal problems. So I was kind of curious, you know, we're kind of walking around exploring the fourth floor. And to my biggest surprise, again, abandoned, run down, holes all over the place, graffiti everywhere. And here's a photo of that. Okay. Now you'll see um, there's just holes everywhere. Um, another thing that, that I found was that the doors had all been removed on the fourth floor. So we walk around through all the different rooms and right when we walked into this one room, I heard this crunch underneath my feet. And I looked down and I realized I had stepped on a dead bird. And if you've never seen a dead bird, you'll actually see a bunch of them in this room because this room was just filled with dozens and dozens of dead birds. Now I'm kind of surprised by this because I had already walked around through the fourth floor and I had not come across any dead animals. But when I walk into this one room to see all these dead birds in this one room, I was like, wow, that's interesting. Because another thing, like I just stated, there were no doors on the fourth floor. So the birds had access to the whole fourth floor. So why did they all choose to die in this one room? Well, come to find out, this is the room that the boy had stayed in. So creep factor has actually gone up just a bit here. So I give the students some of the basic equipment. We're in this room for you know, less than five minutes when to my surprise, all the equipment goes off at the exact same time. We're talking the temperature started to drop in the room and you can feel the room getting colder and colder, almost to the point where I'm expected to see my breath anytime soon. The EMF detector is going off like crazy. Um, the uh, compass is spinning around and around and around and it will not stop. So I'm like, oh my God, I got to document this. I got to prove that this is really happening. So I switch my camera over to video and I start to take infrared video of the room. And I'm filming the students, I'm filming the equipment, I'm proving that this is really happening. Well, then it starts to slow down a little bit. So I realize, okay, before it completely stops, I want to try for some EVPs. So I start asking questions into the air. And I had gotten to the question, can you tell me whose room this is? Now it was about 12 seconds of silence. And then all of a sudden I start to hear crying to the left of me. And I turn and I realize that a couple of female students have started to cry because they're so terrified. So I realize, okay, I'm uncomfortable because I don't have my normal ghost hunting team. This is just a bunch of college students following me around. They're uncomfortable. So I decide let's go ahead and wrap it up and hopefully I'll come back and investigate later. Well, I didn't get a chance to investigate later, but when I finally ended my lecture tour and I got home and started to uh, review all my evidence, I got to the video that I had actually recorded in this room. And I'm gonna play you guys that video, okay? And if you listen carefully, you'll hear when I ask, can you tell me whose room this is? You'll hear the responses, all right? So listen carefully. Can you tell me whose room this is? We'd just like to get some sort of sign that you're here. And there's the crying. You guys okay? Is it still going off? Yeah. This thing's still staying in the It hasn't found north yet? No. All right. So I'll go back to that. I'll play it one more time, just the first part of it, because uh, I don't know how well you guys can hear it or not on your end. But when I had asked, can you tell me whose room this is, I get two responses. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear it says, and I'll edit this, it says, F you. It's mine. All right. So listen carefully. Can you tell me whose room this is? We 
just like to get some sort of sign that you're here. All right. So hopefully you guys were able to hear that. Now, in continuing on, in making contact, as we were just said, had experienced EVP, electronic voice phenomena. Now, this came about in 1959 with Frederick Jorgensen. And he was in the woods with a portable reel-to-reel -reel recorder trying to capture bird calls. And to his surprise, when he played back his recording, he actually captured the voice of a dead relative talking to him. Now, EVPs uh, became very popular back in the 1970s here in the U.S. And I will play you guys an example of one of our EVPs that we actually captured on an investigation. Now, I'm going to play it for you first. Now, I'm not going to tell you what's being said because I feel once I tell you, it becomes suggestive. So I'm going to play it for you first. And I usually like to point, I'll point at the screen when the EVP plays so you know exactly what to be listening for. And then we'll go over the story. So let's play one because I think we're going a little bit over time here. So. I don't think I've ever wore these things longer than five hours. Now that. So in this one, you'll hear the investigator say, I don't usually wear these for more than five hours. This was actually on the USS Turner Joy. And what was happening is we were actually spending the night doing an investigation there. And we had set up a, a camera in an area uh, where activity has actually been uh, recorded. And so we had to go back and change the tapes. And during that time, it's just me and him in this area. He's telling me that he doesn't have to wear his uniform for more than five hours because we decided to go in uh, naval uniforms as what we call triggers. And the interesting thing was, is uh, when it's just him and me in this room, you can actually hear what sounds like a fight breaking out in the background where there's some men yelling and one man yells, butt kicking, all right? So I'll play it one more time, so listen carefully. I don't think I've ever wore these things longer than five hours. Now that... All right, so moving on, there are two types of hauntings. One is an actual haunting. And what that means is there's evidence of intelligence, all right? So these will actually react to you, they'll attempt to make contact, they'll react to their environments, they'll answer questions on EVPs and follow instructions. And apparitions will actually look at you, not through you. Then of course, the other is a residual haunting. And this is about 80% of most hauntings. And what that is, is it's just energy left behind from the living and also the dead, okay? Uh, they're not intelligence, and so it's just like a broken movie that plays over or memory that's trapped in an environment, and it just plays over and over and over again, okay? So when it comes to residual energy, you have to understand when it, negative energy produces high levels of emotional energy. So when you have situations like murder, fighting, or even suicide, somehow those get recorded into the environment. Now... We also find too, that's what's really interesting about this is, let's say, I always use this as a prime example, is a couple moves into a house. Now they fight so much that they divorce and move away. Now another couple can move into this house and if they're sensitive enough, they can actually pick up on the negative energy from the previous couple and they may even fight with each other. So it's not always the dead that leaves these uh, energies behind. Like I said, you yourself probably might have left something behind in a previous place that you lived in. Now, the same thing with a suicide. Someone moves into a room where somebody committed suicide. And if they are sensitive enough, they can actually pick up on that depression. And they may become depressed themselves to the point where they may even attempt suicide. In fact, I've dealt with a college that had to close down a dorm room because on two separate occasions, two students have actually committed suicide in that room. So now they've turned it into a storage room. Yeah. Now explanation for it all. There is none. This is all based off of theories and ideas. Uh, we do believe that they can adjust to their environment. Uh, when it comes to witnessing activity, you also understand that when you're dealing with something intelligent, you're dealing with something that has free will. It doesn't have to communicate to you if it doesn't want to. Then you also have, you just missed it. 
you don't know how many times we're right in the middle of changing our tapes, changing our batteries, changing our memory cards, and things tend to happen. And we always tend to miss it. And then shock. Some of the best investigators will go into shock when they have these experiences and forget to collect the data that's needed to support that experience. And what do the skeptics say? Well, it's all hallucinations. What drugs have we been taking? Obviously the good ones, right? So where do you find ghosts? Well, everywhere. Just because a place is old does not necessarily mean that it's gonna be haunted. It's one out of 10 cases that's gonna provide some sort of evidence that there could be something paranormal going on. So you have to understand with ghost hunting, it's all about being at the right place at the right time. Now we're gonna do a quick photo quiz. So if you guys wanna go ahead and unmute yourselves, I'm gonna see how much you guys have actually learned from this presentation, all right? So I'm gonna show you some photos that have been posted on the internet as proof to the paranormal, okay? And let's see if you can use your investigation skills to come up with a possible answer. To this. So let's go with the first photo. <laughs> Claim to have captured this ghostly figure near the door. I think it's an animal. Yeah, like, a cat reaching cat. up, playing. Yeah. yeah. You can see the laser pointer. Laser pointer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe the cat's just too fast for the, the slow like shutter yeah, speed. The slow mm -hmm. shutter speed. So the cat ran up to try and grab the laser. And as you can see, it just came out as a spurred image. But it has so a glowing red eye. One it's red not eye. a de yeah, demon with one red eye. <laughs> yeah, it's not an example of somebody posting this on the internet as proof to the paranormal. All right. Mm -hmm. How about this one where they claim to have captured this ghostly figure through the window? Uh, like a picture, where? A reflection a of a chair in the wall. Yeah. She cuts off right under the shoulders. <laughs> yeah. It just looks like a magazine or a Kind of look, need a little more information, but yeah. So this is nothing more than a poster on somebody's wall. That's what it looked like. So you two yeah. can have this ghost in your room too. <laughs> <laughs> that is clearly a poster on the wall. Oh, that one. There's no, yeah. This, you can see this ghostly figure outside the car. Uh, no. I don't know, it's glass. I don't like anything with glass. <laughs> Well, glass is a good key element here. So the fact of the matter is, um, one of the things that you always have to ask yourself, is this co the complete picture? Now, obviously it's not because we're looking at a cropped version of the actual ghost itself they're trying to focus on in this picture. So here is the full picture, all right? Oh yeah. So now that you have the full picture, they're trying to take the subject is supposed to be the baby. I, I can see that. Now, was a flash being used? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 How do you know yeah. if a flash was being used? It's all bright. Exactly. The lights are extremely bright. Do you know a flash was being used? Now, we learned this in, in simple science. When light is greater on one side of glass than the other, what happens? It becomes a mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It becomes a mirror. So yeah. what we're really looking at is the, the big reflection mm -hmm. reflecting in the window. There's the baby's foot, and there's his knee. He's wearing those little footy pajamas. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's what you're actually <laughs> seeing. That one lady. I tried to pinch to size it. I went, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> How can I scroll in? Yeah. But again, uh, another photo that's been posted on the internet as proof to the paranormal. So we'll move on to the next. How about this one? <laughs> ah, that's so an app. She's, she's made the rounds in so many pictures. <laughs> she's got to be tired by now. Where obviously if it's too good to be true, then it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's fake. So, and you see this ghost featured on a lot of things. Um, you'll see her featured here. Yeah. Here featured here. <laughs> and even featured here as well. <laughs> Oh man, uh, that's funny. So, in examining the proof, um, one of the things I want to point out that if you are going to pursue this field, educate yourself, learn as much as you can. 
Um, also, as you start to educate yourself, you're going to be able to determine as to what's real and what's fake. And always ask yourself when reviewing photos or videos, why was this taken in the first place? Usually that's your first clue. Okay? Yeah. But no matter what, some may not want to believe in the simplest explanation as others may never believe in the possibility alone. So thank you guys. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation.